I've learned there's two types of people in the world. There are dog people. Those that love those faithful, cute, cuddly, and loyal animals that come along your side. Man and woman's best friend. Then there are cat people. Those that are used to the abuse, neglect, and rejection of that feline creature. You signed yourself up for that. Everybody has a neighborhood cat woman. You know what I'm talking about, the cat lady? Just so happened that my grandfather was the cat man. So Grandpa Jim would invite all the cats of the neighborhood. On any night, he would have 20, 30 cats around his property, and he fed them all tuna fish and pork rinds. I don't know why pork rinds were a thing, but they were. But there was one cat that captured his heart. I know, you guys are all being stumbled by the grumpy cat face right now. We can take it off. One cat that caught his heart, his cat's name was Mutza. Now, it's a Romanian name. I don't know if it's offensive. I apologize. I've not looked it up, but that was the name of the cat. So Mutza was notorious for bringing dead rodents into the house. So it became a, a game my brother and I would play, and we would earn money from my grandmother. It was find the dead rat in the house. So we'd find rats, mice. Some, one time we found a bird and a rabbit. I mean, you just would never know what you would find inside this house. And those rodents would smell so bad. They would stink the whole house up, and that became the game. But nothing compared to the smell of Easter weekend, 1991. See, I was a 90s baby. Anybody else born in the 80s and grew up in the 90s? Now, I get so jealous of my kids in modern Easter. See, there was no Pinterest back then. There was no gourmet food. It was the era of processed food. And I love Easter, don't get me wrong, but it was truly a potluck when you went to grandma's house. No one was a gourmet chef other than my mother. So you never knew what to expect. See, there was no Easter ham with brown sugar and honey glazed. We had the canned ham. Anybody else know what I'm talking about? You would pull that tin back and there was this giant thick layer of white jello you would scrape off with a knife. You would take that pectin and shake it off. That was the Easter ham that we were used to eating. There was no gourmet mac and cheese. There was no breadcrumb crust. It was Kraft mac and cheese from the box, baby. And your aunt would bring it over and she left it on the stove too long. It was burnt on the bottom. That was the mac and cheese you grow up to love. And you take that ham and that hot dog and you cut it up on the inside. You know what I'm talking about. And for dessert, there was Jello Jigglers. Come on, anybody remember that? None of this all natural stuff. We had red 40 and blue 30. That was the flavor I grew up with. And my kids, they're so spoiled. They have these plastic Easter eggs filled with candy and prizes. Some families give money. Back in my day, we would take eggs, hard boil them, dip them in acid and food coloring, tell your cuticles around your nail beds would burn. That was a real Easter egg hunt. And you would go around, you would hide those eggs, and your prize was that egg. You would crack it open, eat it with salt. That was Easter in the 90s. Anybody want to give me a shout for that? Come on. That was how real Easter was done. And we'd hide these eggs all around the house. But that Easter Sunday, 1991, I was nearly eight. My brother was three and a half. We had to hide the eggs indoors because it was rainy outside. And so the whole goal was, who could hide the most eggs that no one would find? Have our Easter egg hunt. It's a great night. We spend the night at my grandparents' house. The next morning, my grandmother wakes me up. and says, boys, there's a problem. What's that? Mutza brought more dead animals in the house. We go out in the living room, and it is awful. It smells disgusting. And I realize that's not the smell of a rat. That's the eggs that I hid that no one found. <laughs> so I wait till my grandmother leaves the room. Go over to the couch, pull them out, and there's this whole giant bag full of them right underneath the couch. Put it in a bowl. My grandmother comes in. I go all sheepishly. say, Grandma, it's not a, not a smell of a rat. She said, what was it? I said, it's Easter eggs. I look her in the eyes. I think it's my brother Preston that hid them. But let's go easy on him. He's young. That's how it went that day. We got rid of the smell. See, we live in an incredibly sanitized society. Very rarely do we encounter death and decay. We have trash taken out weekly from our houses. We have rodent removal on our streets. When you go to a funeral, it's a closed casket. It's very rare that someone would see a dead body in normal everyday life in America. 
That's not how it was in the first century. You see, for us, death is not a regular occurrence. It was a daily occurrence in the first century. For us, the cross is a symbol of hope, a symbol of comfort, a symbol of freedom. However, just the very word or image evoked trauma in the life of its hearer. Here's what we have to understand. The cross was a demonstration of Rome's power. It was believed to be the cruelest form of punishment ever invented. Just the very word would incite trauma in the hearts of somebody that heard it. In 70 BC, there was this slave turned gladiator that led a revolution. His name was Spartacus. You ever heard of Spartacus before? So Spartacus actually gathered an army. could not believe this. He actually gathered an army of 120,000 slaves to come and, you know, revolt against Rome and the slavery that was happening. Well, eventually Spartacus was defeated. And to show their form of power, they crucified 6,000 men along the Appian Way. This was a common expression of Rome's power, that you will not challenge the power of Rome. There was no more brutal form of death. See, when you were crucified, hung up to a cross, your limbs were dislocated. And just the very act of breathing was excruciating. See, Rome didn't have any opposition other than the small, pesky group of people known as the Jews. The Jews were one they could not handle or deal with, so they decided to partner with. So these Jews, they learned, were actually really good at collecting taxes and were really good with money. So they put them in charge of collecting taxes throughout the region. So from this, they had this unique partnership and there was a man they put in charge named Herod. Herod became a king. Well, Herod had heard that the Jews believed in what they called the promised one. And Herod thought that he could become that promised one. The Hebrew word was Mashiach, which we translate Messiah. Messiah means the anointed one or the smeared one. So Herod thought he could take on this position. From that, he ended up building them their second temple. And this temple was gorgeous and luxurious, but unfortunately he was used by the Jews, disregarded by them, and in fury tried to hold on to his position of power. He got rumor from these wise men that there was this supposed Messiah born in Bethlehem. As a result, he initiated a genocide of all those two and under in the Bethlehem region. Time passes by. It was a really tentious time between Rome and Israel, the Jews, as they fought against them. Many messiahs would rise up to try to challenge the power of Rome, but no one was successful. See, there had been many years since they had heard the voice of God, the voice of Yahweh. See, God would use these people called the prophets that would speak on his behalf. The last prophet they had heard of was a man named Malachi. And out of nowhere, this man comes out of the wilderness wearing camel's hair, eating locusts and honey. And he begins to speak from the scroll of Isaiah. And he says, I am the voice of the one calling out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. His name was John the Baptist. John began to baptize people and command them to have repentance and forgiveness of sin. One day he's at the Jordan River and his cousin approaches him for baptism. And as his cousin approaches him, he hears the voice of God say, behold the Lamb of God. And he all of a sudden realizes the person standing in front of him is the anointed one. It's the Messiah. And he tells his cousin, no, 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 I can't baptize you. You must baptize me. In which he replies, you must so that it might be fulfilled. He baptizes his cousin. Heavens open up. They hear this voice thunder. This is my son in whom I'm well pleased. People are shook by this. And his cousin Jesus enters the wilderness for 40 days. No one heard anything from him. He comes back from the wilderness and he's a different man. He's emaciated. He'd been fasting for 40 days. He enters the synagogue. As he gets inside, it's his turn to read. He comes up to the front, opens the scroll of Isaiah, reads from Isaiah 61 and says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me and is anointing me to preach good news and declare the year of the Lord's favor. He then sits down in the Messiah's chair. He meant business. The rumors begin to spread. Isn't this just Jesus, the carpenter's son? He's Mary's kid. But he comes out from that place and he backs up the claims of the Messiah. He begins to heal the sick and release people from demons. Mark chapter 3, verse 
Mark chapter 1, verse 32, it says, They brought to him all who were sick, all who were oppressed by demons. And the whole city was gathered together at the door and healed many who were sick with various diseases and cast out demons. And he would not permit the demons to speak because they knew who he was. Let me tell you this, church. Anything that oppresses you knows his name. And he begins to set them free. See, now normally what would happen is this Messiah would gather political teams around him. He would gather and pick a political party. There was two primary parties. The Pharisees and the Sadducees were the most prominent. Closest thing we have would be like Democrat and Republican. So from that, he, you would normally pick a political party and you would assemble your army. Jesus doesn't do that. He bypasses both those teams. He goes up to a mountain in Mark chapter 3. It says he comes down from the mountain and he picks 12 disciples whom he calls apostles, and he gives them authority to cast out demons. Now, the team he picks is not a team any of us would pick. These are not our first picks. None of us would pick them. This is not the Golden State Warriors. We're talking Sacramento Kings, people. I'm sorry, Corey. I had to say it. I had to say that. I'm sorry. Trust me. I bleed with all of you. I bleed with all of you. We're not talking the A team. We're talking the Goonies, my friends. This is the island of misfit toys. No one would ever pick this team. He calls these fishermen and tax collectors. He doesn't get lawyers and politicians. As he does this, his family thinks he's gone crazy. Mark chapter 3, 21. When his family heard this, they went out to restrain him. For people were saying, he has gone out of his mind. John then says in chapter 7 that his brothers did not believe in him. They rejected him. This has become incredibly divisive. We all know that the people that know you the best are your family members. Am I right? And his family pulls support, but he continues to move forward. He starts multiplying food. Rumors of him walking on water takes place. And the Pharisees' jealousy continues to grow against Jesus. But there was one miracle that changed everything. John chapter 11, verse 41. And he walked up and said, so take away this stone. And Jesus called in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. Jesus said to them, take off the grave clothes and let him go. Verse 45, therefore many of the Jews who had come to visit Mary had seen what Jesus did and believed in him. See, no miracle had ever been accomplished like this. See, there was this Jewish superstition that believed that the spirit of a person would hover around the body for three days. After three days, there was no chance Lazarus was dead for four. This was a miracle that was unmatched. And the Pharisees knew when this rumor spread, it was over. John 11, verse 53. So from that day on, they plotted to take his life. Therefore, Jesus could no longer move pu publicly around Judea. He went into hiding for a period of time, but he knew that his time had come. And he set his face towards Jerusalem. His disciples said, Jesus is too dangerous. He says, I have to. This is the mission my father has sent me on. John chapter 12, he enters the city. It says, the next day a great crowd had come for the festival and heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. And they took palm branches and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. This was the phrase for the God who saves. He was the king. He was Messiah. The expectations of the Messiah where they would break the oppressor. They would remove Roman rule. From this, he sets out for Passover. He gathers his disciples. Normally at a Passover feast, he would be the guest of honor. And he invites them in. He pours jars of water and he washes his disciples' feet. He says, I want you to take note of this. Peter rejects it. He says, no, you must. He says, I want you to take note of this. As I've done to you, you must do unto others. It sets the stage for a very unique Passover. They've celebrated two others with him. This is now the third. And as he's there and they're sharing the cup and the bread, he breaks the bread and says, this is my body broken for you. Take this in remembrance of me. And they do this and they don't understand. 
He passes the cup and says, this is the blood of my covenant for the forgiveness of your sins. Take this in remembrance of me. They're caught off guard by this. They're, they're with the favored king of the time. This is the movement, and he's, he's talking about his flesh and his blood, and they don't understand. He says, tonight, one of you is going to betray me. Not knowing how to respond, they say, surely not me, Lord. Surely not I, they go around the room. He says, no, one of you will. And he begins to pray, and he tells them, go, do what you must. It must be fulfilled. One of the disciples leaves. The night ends. They've had way too much wine. If you've ever been to a real Passover feast, you ain't stumbling out. I'll tell you that much. You are barely being carried out sometimes. They come out of the Passover feast, and he goes to pray in the garden. It was a regular garden they would go and pray in. He says, listen, pray that you might not fall into temptation. Disciples can't keep their eyes open. But as he's there, he finishes praying and up walks Judas with armed guards. They say, we're looking for Jesus of Nazareth, in which he replies, I am he. His voice shakes them. They fall to the ground, not knowing what to do. And Jesus doesn't resist arrest. And as he comes forward, Peter lunges out, pulls out his sword, and it says he strikes the ear of one of the guards named Malchus. Now, this is always something that's been debated. It says he cuts off his ear. And let me just say this. Peter doesn't pull out his sword and cut upwards. That's the worst sword fighting technique you could ever imagine. He pulls out his sword and he goes and he, he strikes for the head, but the man turns his head and he cuts off his ear. Peter intended blood to protect his savior, to protect his king. Jesus grabs the ear, puts it back on, heals him. Men don't know what to do. And then take him in. Peter denies him three times, broken. He's abandoned by his disciples, those that were willing to fight for him. He's brought to the high priest at the time. They can't really find a charge or an accusation against him. So they bring him to Pilate, Pontius Pilate, the famed Roman governor. Now, as I was searching up Pilate, Google decided to change my search every time to Pilates. And let me let you know this. Pilate did not invent Pilates. That's not how it works. If you want Pilates, contact Amy Patterson in the front row. She'll take you and train you. Just kidding. Maybe not. So Pilate looks at him and says this. Am I a Jew? Replied Pilate. Your own people and chief priests hand you over to me. What is it you've done? Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest. But now my kingdom is from another place. You are a king then, Pilate said. Jesus answered, you say that I'm a king. In fact, the reason I was born in this world is to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of me listens to the truth. Pilate said, what is truth? And with this, he went out again to the Jews. If Pilate would have stayed a moment longer, he would realize truth was the one that he questioned. He looked at Jesus in the eyes and walked away. Jesus not defending himself. He then leads him out and says, it's my custom to release to you one prisoner at the time of Passover. Do you want me to release the king of the Jews? In which they shout about, no, give us Barabbas. Barabbas was also another insurrectionist, a criminal. And he releases him. See, here's what we have to understand. Pilate was not a gracious man. Pilate was a wicked ruler. He was not one that would be lenient to anyone that would be leading a rebellion. Josephus, the famed historian of the first century, would write many times about the horrible things that he had done and the punishments that he had given. Jesus even quotes the time that he murdered these Galileans and mingled their blood with their sacrifice. Pilate was not gracious, but what he does is this. He releases Barabbas and he takes Jesus back has him flogged. He's beaten 39 times with a cat of nine tails as his flesh is mutilated. They beat him time and time again. They twist a crown of thorns and put it upon his head and they mock him and they put a purple robe on his back. His back's completely cut open as it begins to press against his skin. You just can't imagine the pain. He brings him out intending to have him released in which the crowd yells crucified. 
the same thing that was done to Spartacus and his men, the same thing that was done to anybody that challenged Rome, was now Jesus' punishment with no clear legal grounds. He's given a cross. He attempts to carry it. Someone helps him. They nail his hands. They raise him up. And as they look, the disciples have abandoned him, all except the women that served him and his mother alongside John. Could you imagine the day your son, your friend, the one you carried, the one that you were rejected for because pity thought that you had a child out of wedlock is now hanging on a cross in front of you for a crime he did not commit. And as he's there, he looks down and turns to John and says, behold, this is your mother. Mary, this is your son. And John took care of Mary. Why was this? Because his family abandoned even their mother because she pledged allegiance to Jesus. Jesus recognizes that the time had come and he said, it is finished. And he released his spirit. He was dead. Everyone knew it. Sun was about to set. So to make sure the Roman guards came, took a spear, pierced his side, up underneath his rib cage, piercing his heart, in which blood and water came out. There was no sign of life left. Joseph of Arimathea came and said, please let me take the body. He was a private disciple, along with a man named Nicodemus, we find from chapter three of John. They take him, they put him in the proper burial garb, and they place him in a unused tomb. The Pharisees are concerned. They put a stone in front of it and they make sure there's armed guards and around it because they were concerned that these disciples would steal the body. Passover night's a night of celebration. Passover night's a night of liberation and freedom. But the families went home that night in utter despair as they mourned their friend, Savior, and King. Sunday morning, the women come to finish the job they could not on Friday. As they're there, Luke 24, verse 1. First day of the week, dawn came. They came to the tomb, taking spices that they had prepared. They had found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they went in, they did not find the body. While they were perplexed about this, suddenly two men in dazzling clothes stood beside them. The women were terrified and bowed their faces to the ground. But the men said to them, why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He is risen. Church, the same words that were said 2,000 years ago apply today. Why do you look for the living among the dead? He is risen. He's not here. He's not rolled away in a tomb. He's the living God that's been lifted above death and the grave. And that's the power that's accessible, acceptable to us today. So from that, these last two years have been some of the hardest years of many of your lives. You've been depressed. You've been discouraged. You've lost your job. You've lost friends. You've had friends move out of state saying California is forbidden and God doesn't have a plan. Let me tell you, God's moving in California, church. But from this, we continue to look for life among dead things. We continue to turn to substances. We continue to turn to broken relationships. We continue to turn for that which will never bring us life when the only answer is Jesus. He promises you life and life abundantly. You know, many people come to church on Easter just hoping that they, their friend can hear the message so they don't go to hell. Let me tell you, an invitation of Jesus in your life is much more than a get out of hell free card. He said, this is eternal life that you might know me. See, there's a power in this resurrection. And what takes place after this, many of you might think, well, it's just a myth. It's just a religious story. It's something we tell once a year to our kids. And then we hunt Easter eggs. Let me tell you this. What Sean said in the beginning is exactly what I want to close with. The last messengers you would choose to share the story of a resurrected king would be women in that time frame. Here's what we have to understand. Christianity changed entire cultures on how we treat women. 
We recognize in our culture that there is equal footing, that they are made in the image and likeness of God. That was not so in the first century, especially in the Greco-Roman and Jewish culture. See, Philo, the famed philosopher of the time, said that the women's role is best served silent and submissive. This was a common belief. They were not even considered legal witnesses in court. You would never trust the opinion of a woman. From that, you would think, well, maybe the Jews, understanding that they read the same Old Testament we do, maybe they would have a higher view. No, every morning, the Jewish man in their common book of prayer that's not biblical, this is from the, Mish from the Mishnah, they would say, Yahweh, I thank you that I'm not a woman, but you've called me to be a man. Every morning. If this is a myth, why would you write down this which would discount and be humiliating? From this, the women go and report to these apostles, these disciples of Jesus. And Luke writes, and behold, they believed it was an idle tale. See, we actually lose a lot in the Greek right there. It actually implies that they were mentally sick and insane. That was the belief. These men come back to the grave, realizing the report is true. If you made up this witness, you as the founders of this faith and religion, why would you ever embarrass yourself like this? It's because it happened. There are many great books that talk about the resurrection of Jesus, the validity of its proof. I believe a lot of it's found in the text here today. And we'll close with this. Jesus visits his disciples. They're changed. And Luke continues on this story in Acts chapter 1. And in Acts 1, after Jesus ascends, after 40 days of visiting his disciples, it casually says this, they went away to an upper room to pray for 10 days. And with them was Mary and Jesus's brothers. The same brothers that rejected him, the same brothers that rejected their mother are now coming to the prayer meeting, believing for the promise of the Holy Spirit. Let's push it one step further. His two brothers that were underneath him, so the oldest brother at that time was James, followed by Jude. They become leaders in the church. James is the leader of the church of Jerusalem, and they're both known for being martyrs. You don't give your life for someone you don't believe in, for a hoax, for a myth, especially if it's your brother that you grew up with. James and Jude each have a letter in the New Testament and they both open their letters in a similar way. They don't call themselves the brothers of Jesus. They don't refer to him as their family member. They open their letters as this, slaves of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. Christ. They recognized that their brother was not just a man. He was not just a boy that they grew up with. He was Savior and he was King. And they were willing to rest and give their life up for that man. See, he promised us a few chapters earlier after he spoke to Pontius Pilate. Pilate said, what is truth? He said in John 14, I am the way the truth in the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. See, we have this promise today. It says in Romans 10, 9, if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus Christ is Lord, not friend, not casual acquaintance, but King of your life, and that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. For many of us, we've been told if you say a simple prayer and live your life as normal, then you'll all be fine on that day when you meet him. I'm sorry, church, it's not true. Jesus is asking for your surrender and your life entirely. And that's the resurrection promise. It starts with a simple prayer, but it begins by you taking up your cross and following him. Let us close today with the earliest hymn we have recorded in the Bible, the New Testament. It's found in Philippians chapter two, verse six. And Jesus, he was in the form of God, did not regard himself, equality with God as a thing to be exploited, but he emptied himself, 
taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness and being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, death on a cross. Therefore, God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that the name of Jesus, every knee will bow in heaven and earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. This is the promise we hold today. This is the confession of our faith. We celebrate Easter, not as a day of great food and family, but a resurrected King who left that grave empty, my friends. This is the promise and extension that we have today. Let's give a shout to Jesus as we declare His resurrection.